There has always been one storytelling tool that I have found incredibly fascinating when leveraged properly. The protagonist losing. As the viewer, you follow the character with the assumption that he will ultimately be victorious. So experiencing a loss should feel impactful either way, right? Well, that's the thing. While all stories obviously have some sort of setback for the protagonist, very few manage that balance between the loss being meaningful, realistic, as well as setting up the ultimate triumph in the future. And note that we won't be talking about narrative as where the entire premise is around watching the protagonist's downfall, a la Breaking Bad. Here, we are talking about the quote-unquote good characters and how they deal with losses. And so, today we'll be embarking on a two-part mini-series where we'll examine two different approaches to the main characters losing, with the first video being about Avatar The Last Airbender and the second being Invincible. In the case of Avatar, there are many instances of the gang losing and having to flee. Many storylines are even based around this premise. The whole Zuko arc is essentially the gang trying to outrun him. The introduction of Azula also sees the characters beaten and having to flee. Then Aang's total defeat at the hands of Azula, and even Sparky Sparky Boom Man fits this idea. And while all of these encounters are very good examples of Avatar's writing, always retaining those same high stakes instead of constantly upping power levels, there has always been a particular moment that I feel is a flawlessly written instance of the characters experiencing utter and total defeat in more ways than one. The two-parter of the Day of Black Sun. In order to put this into perspective, I feel like it's worth taking a step back for a moment and talking about the importance of the event in the first place. As soon as episode 8, we find out that Aang has to defeat the Fire Lord before Sozin's Comet returns. Right away, we have a strict deadline at which we reach the point of no return. We then learn that all of the avatars before Aang have had many years to master the elements, something that Aang has to achieve in a mere few months. For the next 22 episodes, and I'm saying these numbers on purpose, so bear with me, Aang continues his rush training process, but even with the knowledge of air, water, and earth, it becomes evident that they need a plan that doesn't involve Aang facing the Fire Lord alone, since he is still unsure if he can even learn firebending in time. This brings us to the episode titled The Library during which we learn of a piece of information that can truly turn the tide in this war. An upcoming solar eclipse that would take away the firebenders bending. Thus, we have a concrete date around which the gang has to form a plan. With this knowledge, the next 20 episodes deal with making this plan come to fruition. And during this period of time, another very important event happens. Aang and the crew reach Ba Sing Se only to learn that the military is horribly corrupt and in cahoots with Azula. This is the first instance of the gang facing complete defeat. Traditionally, you'd think that after the miraculous survival of Aang, his return would be triumphant, right? And that's when we arrive at the Day of Black Sun. Again, this is something that we've been building up ever since Episode 8. 42 episodes of anticipating this great battle between Aang and the Fire Lord. And I feel like the episode just before this one perfectly encapsulates how meaningful this episode is on first viewing. The episode fittingly named Nightmares and Daydreams is all about Aang trying to get some rest before the big battle, just like you and I would before a big event. And from the story writing perspective, this builds anticipation for us too. Why would we prepare for something so much if it would end in a loss? That would be anticlimactic, right? But again, if you play it right, it can become one of the greatest events in the series. So, let's talk about it more in depth and go through all of the important events, as there is much more than meets the eye. The episode opens with who I view as the true protagonist of this episode, Sokka going over his battle plans one last time. Shortly after, the joint forces arrive and it's time for Sokka to present the strategy for everyone. Again, notice how this is being built up as one last battle. We then cut to the other side of the conflict, Zuko, who's fighting with the consequences of the events at Ba Sing Se. 
Zuko plays a very crucial role here. Everything starting from the parallels of him taking his armor off while Sokka puts his on, to his ultimate confrontation of the Fire Lord is meant to mirror the main gang. We see just how much the decision to lie about Aang's death has been gnawing at him, and now that the Avatar is making a return, we fully expect Zuko to finally go down for good. More on that later. Cutting back to the assault team, we see them resurface for one last time before the attack begins properly, and here we get another very important scene. The kiss between Aang and Katara. This is another thing that has been cooked up ever since the very first episodes, so this moment between them, just like with a lot of what I've mentioned already, signals that we are entering a climax. We believe that this really is the last moment of peace before they enter complete hell. But again, all set up so far. As the attack commences, we see the joint forces slowly gain ground over the Fire Nation, and very intentionally, we see the height of their power as they break through the wall, and the music is this triumphant theme, signaling at a final victory. And in case this wasn't hammered home enough, Bato even tells Sokka that they are on their way to victory. But then, the music sharply cuts out as we cut to Aang and witness his realization that he has been played. And just like that, the entire tide of battle flips on its head. The supposed victory of the joint forces just achieved vanishes into thin air. After Aang returns to the gang, we can already see that his spirit is broken, but despite this, the battle goes on, with Sokka, Toph and Aang going after the Fire Lord one last time. As they find their way into the secret chambers below, we are once again led to believe that Aang may be victorious after all, but again, he is met with disappointment, as he sees Azula slouching in the chair. Bending or no bending, they are simply tricked here, and the fight is well and truly over. In a perfect example of subverting expectations, all of that build-up, all of that preparation over the last 40 plus episodes, led to nothing. They lost. And speaking more broadly, this is what truly subverting expectations means by the way. Not a randomly killed off character, which is how I believe, most people think of this nowadays. Starting back as far as the season 2 finale when Aang survived Azula's blast, every moment has been establishing the idea that this assault would be the end. But it wasn't. And if this blow hadn't been hard enough, most of the soldiers have to be left behind, as they have no escape route other than Appa. And thus, the plan has completely fallen apart. And with the joint forces now being locked up, there is no second chance at this type of assault. The final opportunity before Sozin's Comet, gone. As for Zuko, who do you expect to see punishment for his lies about the Avatar's demise, is victorious in this episode. For the first time in the show, the roles are entirely flipped. The joint forces who you'd fully expect to win, both by the narrative tones being established, as well as the pure strategic sense, are left in shambles, but the single character who is truly alone in the middle of this conflict is the victor, becoming the catalyst that would lead Aang to his victory later in the series. Furthermore, returning to the episode before this one, we also see that same mirroring of the gang and Zuko. While Aang is pushing himself far enough to actually hallucinate, Zuko, although still conflicted about the whole thing, is enjoying his life as royalty. Another instance of us being primed to root for Aang and want Zuko to go down. I remember watching this for the very first time when I was much, much younger, and oh man, was this a massive slap in the face. But ever since then, I've been absolutely amazed by how well this defeat is handled. While it is a pretty big downer, instead of leaving you hopeless, it makes you excited as you see Zuko finally go against the Fire Nation, which is the shot we leave on. Purposely show you that they may have lost the battle, but the war is not over. 
And speaking more broadly, you have to remember the audience of the series. This is Nickelodeon we're talking about, so having the protagonist lose at every turn is very brave. But needless to say, I loved every second of it. And I just hope we would see more series be brave enough to have the protagonist straight up lose. The amount of storytelling opportunities that opens up are just too great. You can have overpowered characters because they are not meant to be defeated. You can completely flip the story on its head where the protagonist now has to recover from the defeat, which is especially important for long-running series where the one-up factor may have already started to creep in. Take World of Warcraft for example. Yes, I have to bring it up when talking about this. You don't need to have played the game to know that the general gist is a new bad guy is introduced, we level up, defeat him, and the world is saved. But what if one of those times we lose, and the world is changed forever? Just think about the possibilities that opens up. Entirely new story arcs built on the premise that we are just trying to survive, not actively fighting back. But yes, you do have to take the psychological factor in mind as well. Watching the characters you like constantly losing is not entertaining or enjoyable. But with that being said, I do think having some peaks and valleys would prove greatly beneficial, especially in the long term, just like we've seen with Avatar and even with a series like The Walking Dead. And on this note, I shall see you in the next part of this series, where we will take a look at another story that is not afraid of having its characters lose. And that brings us to the end of this video. I've really been meaning to get back into making Avatar content, so after binging the entirety of Invincible, I was inspired to talk about this narrative aspect of these two shows. I know this video is quite a bit shorter than what you'd expect from me nowadays, but this was very much an impromptu one that I just felt inspired to make. Other than that, if you enjoyed the video, I'd appreciate it if you did all the YouTube things to let the algorithm know. And if you wish to support the channel even further, consider joining the Patreon, where you can pledge as little as one buckaroo per month and get access to all the benefits. Speaking of which, massive shoutout to our first patron Conjured, who has just joined the highly coveted Mystery Shack Insiders Club. Thank you, thank you for supporting what I do. All of my socials and links are below in the description as usual. But other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a great day and hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.